it occurred to me as we were in Israel and just this amazing uh, truth that um, we were walking in the land where um, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth where God himself became one of us, the incarnation. And and, and it hard to just bring it in because I didn't see him there walking. I didn't see the white robe and the blue sash. I didn't see that anywhere. Um, just kidding. That's, that's Hollywood. Um, but um, just... Um, But wanting to draw that in the whole time, wanting to draw that in, that he walked here and the miracles that were done and these different places that we're at really happened and they're recorded. And some of the things that um, they're uh, uncovering, the uh, archaeological digs, some of the sites he went to, or just one more evidence that the Bible's true. The Bible already said it and all of a sudden there it is. There were some of these places where... uh, they didn't know it was under there. They'd been walking all over the top of this stuff and then somebody decided, hey, there might be something. Down. So they start digging and all of a sudden they uncovered this huge Colosseum. There, <laughs> there, were, there were rows of seats that Herod built and it's like, really? Right under your feet. Um, so uh, amazing time. Um, um, hot Oh, I've never been in, in 100 degree weather like that, hot, and it, it affected me. I wasn't quite ready for that. Um, but the truth that God himself came into his creation and he touched down, and I'd like that first slide there, uh, Tony, if you have that first slide. In uh, 1969, many of you were around at that time, 1969, July 20th, I believe it was, 1969. There was a man there named Neil Armstrong, and this is what he said. One small step for man and one giant step for mankind. So 50-some years ago, he landed on, we landed on the moon. And if you were in school at that time, they brought in the TVs, and so everybody was watching this happen, and they were seeing this whole thing being recorded. And, and so across our nation and really the world, people were watching man touch down into another world. Another world. Another world. He stepped down into another world. And so we were just in awe. And it's just an amazing thing in our time, that that possibility. But what amazed me the most, as I said earlier, is that God himself touched down into the earth that he created. And he took on human form, just like you and me. And he walked around. He showed us how to live this life that he had planned for us. But he planned for it to be lived with him, with him. That was the whole plan, that he would be among us and in us and that his spirit would be in us. And so here's Jesus stepping down into our lives. Um, So um, this first part I called get ready. And, And here's what was interesting to me is that God needed to get his people ready for his coming. And he had a specific place, just like the astronauts, there was a specific place that they'd planned for that landing. It had to be just right. So there was a specific place that God was going to touch down in human form onto earth, into this world from his kingdom, from the heavenly kingdom to this world. And so he needed to get the land ready. He needed to get the people ready, all in the right place. So the people that he chose came from Ur of the Chaldeans. And so he talked to Abram at the time. And he talked to Abram and he said, I need you to go to this land. And it was all in preparation for years to follow that the land that he was going to and to be with the people there was the land 
that the creator himself was going to come and visit that particular land. And then Natalie and I got to walk there. That, of all the places on planet Earth, that was where he was going to come. And it's interesting, they say that Israel is about the size of New Jersey. That's pretty small when you think about the United States, right? And then you think about uh, just that little place in all the world, that little place. Jesus didn't travel more than 70 miles or maybe 100 miles at the most. That this was the land. This was the place that the Messiah would come and step into our world. Okay, so Abraham. So Abram was called Abraham. Later, he would, uh, God would give him the, um, at first, this is interesting. He just spoke to Abram. Later, he would appear to Abraham. But at first, he spoke to him. And I find that amazing. How did he know it was God talking to him? He, you know, later, uh, God would show up in a burning bush, the angel and the, and the burning bush to Moses, but how did he know? And he said, I want you to go to um, take your family. I want you to go to this land that you don't know about, but I want you to go. Wow. So open up your scriptures to the first book in the Bible, Genesis, and I want you to see something that he tells Abraham to do. Genesis uh, chapter... Uh, is it 13? Let's see. Yes, chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. So this is after um, he had a little scuffle with, uh, not a scuffle, disagreement with Lot. And Lot went and chose this area down here. And, and so there was a lot going on here. But look at... Uh, uh, let's start at verse uh, 14. So Genesis, first book in the Bible, uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, verse 15. And all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Now listen, look at verse 17. Arise and walk in the land through the length of it and the width of it, for I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent, went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Amri and which are in the Hebron and built an altar there to the Lord. He heard the Lord and he believed what he was saying. And so Abraham then, through his life, he walked the length and the width of Israel, of that promised land. Interesting. He was getting ready. God was getting ready for when himself, the incarnation, Christ the Messiah would come and set foot on that land. So he had to bring him to that land. But I want to ask you a question that I asked myself, and I think the Lord was asking me to. How do you know when God's talking to you? Now, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you, you responded, you repented of the world's way of living, your old way of living, you repented, you, were, you, you decide to follow him, so you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and, uh, and you received the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit was working on you all the time, but you received his power to do this new life that you were given. So then, uh, back to my question. So because that's the case, how do you know when God is talking to you? Uh, raise your hand if you have an answer. How do you know? What is one one evidence that God is talking to you? Yes. Still small voice. Okay, so a quiet voice, a still small voice. Diane. When you read the Bible. Okay, you can be sure that the Holy Spirit is speaking you through His Word. 
And if you, if you sit there long enough, it will begin happening because all of a sudden the, the Spirit illuminates His Word into your mind. But sometimes you've got to wait for it. It's not like a five-minute deal. Okay, I got it. Got it. Good. It's, no, no, I want, I want you to get it. Here's something interesting. Every time you open the Word, He's going to give you something to do. Not, not just to learn. But there's always an application to whatever. So don't open your Bible if you don't want to do it. <laughs> don't do it because it's, there's always an application. The Holy Spirit wants you to not only know it, but to get up and, and do it. Okay, so anybody else? How do you know that God is speaking to you? Through his word, we got that, still small voice. How do you know it's him and not just you thinking? How, how do you know? Anybody else? A level of peace, level of peace Brady said. Amen, Amen to that? Amen. Oh, my goodness, yes. Um, Crystal. Holy Spirit is making that true, okay? Peace, Holy Spirit. Anybody else over here? How do you know? Yes. It won't, okay. contradict, the word of God. It won't contradict the Word of God. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. So that kind of, Carol. Okay. Okay. So God gives you that, that burning desire to follow him, to know him. So I wrote down a couple of things here and, uh, and, and scripture came to mind. Philippians 4, 8, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's virtuous, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on those things. And so that's what came to my mind, first of all, is it, this coming in, is it true, first of all? Is it, is, it, is it honorable? Is it pure? All those things. Okay, so that's one way to know. Okay, that, that may be of God. Here's another one. Um, Galatians 5.22. Maybe we could say it together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When those things are part of this thinking that come to mind, we can know that's the evidence of the Holy Spirit, that this is the outcome, is love. And going, okay, I'm going to grab hold of that because that's, God speaking to me through his word, through peace, through uh, the Holy Spirit, um, through all these things that are good. This is what his kingdom is about. Okay, so the question still is, how do you know he's speaking to you? Here's another one that I came up with. And this is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you want to go there. So you were in Genesis. We're going to leave the Old Testament, travel to the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's something I think is most impressive and amazing about how do you know it's God speaking to you? Let's begin at verse 14. So we're in 2 Corinthians, not 1 and not Colossians, and not Chronicles, because that, that's in the Old Testament. And I know there's a lot of C books there. But, okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died that those who live will no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Is that amazing? When that kind of stuff comes into your mind, you go, what? I'm no longer living for myself. This is something for somebody else. This isn't just me, 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 I want, I want. This is, now I know God's speaking to me because it's not selfishness. It's God's love. But 
It's action for the love of Christ in us compels us. So I want you to see a little bit more here. So I'm asking the question, how did Abraham know that God was talking to him? How do you know that God is talking to you? Okay, it says, therefore from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. What? What? We're, we're thinking beyond the physical. And he says, even though we knew Christ in the flesh, even though we, this is yet, we, we know him thus no longer. We, now we know him in the spirit, right? The Christ spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is Holy Spirit work. So they come back to that question. How do you know he's speaking to your heart, to your mind? We don't regard anyone according to the flesh. There's a spiritual warfare going on. We understand the spirit world. You've been born of the spirit. You've been born into the kingdom of God. The spirit now you've been awakened. Your spirit is awakened, connecting to God. So now you see things not just in the flesh, but now you see things in the spirit realm. There's, we don't fight against each other. We fight against the spirit world of darkness. That's where our battle is. That's an amazing revelation. When God is speaking to you, what is, he, what is this truth? Okay, so he says then, verse 19, that that Christ was, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now let me back up to 18. I missed that one. Now, all things are of God who, have recon, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what is that word? That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses or not counting their sins against them, he has committed to us the word of this reconciliation, of this um, coming to God, that he deals with the sin and he's not counting it on us. Okay. Now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God, we're pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the third thing that came to my mind is that I'm an ambassador of God. And my God-giving role now as a believer is to reconcile people to God. And, and that's through Christ. That's, that's now the Christ spirit in me. That's when I know God speaking to my heart and mind is when I'm thinking about somebody that's lost, reconciling them to God so they could be saved for all eternity. I've become a, a, a life preserver that he can use wherever I go. So those three things came to mind as well as what you said was great stuff. But how do you know that God's talking to you and it's the good for others and it's finally the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That same spirit in us says, I'm part of that working out, part of that plan. That's part of the agenda. That's, okay. So God was using Abraham to get ready this land on which he would um, come to, that he would, that he would um, set down. So then what's the next picture I have there, um, So there's a picture of the Holy Land and uh, there's the, the, the wailing wall that the Hebrew people go and they pray and they put prayers into and, and apparently there are prayer books there on their stations. They can go and pick up a prayer book and recite prayers and, and they're praying for the Messiah to come. He's come. But this is kind of where it's at now and just so that you know, um, during the... Uh, uh, Constantine era, uh, the Byzantine era, when um, he conquered this land, um, he made he made the uh, the national religion Christianity, and so um, 
his mom kind of inspired uh, the putting churches on these different spots where, like where Jesus was born and, and where he was crucified. So, uh, um, so there was an amazing time where it was beautiful to be a Christian. Matter of fact, if you weren't, uh, that could be painful. So that's the kind of stuff that was happening there. But they built these churches over these sites. And, uh, and then through the years, of course, uh, uh, different religious groups came in, the Muslims came in, and, and they turned all the churches into mosques. And so there's, th- there's that battle. And then, so at some time, that was built right on, um, right on the, the temple site. Um, so anyways, um, his land that he prepared to come to way before this has happened, right? There was another temple, another day, that Jesus ends up walking into. So this, this place, this place. So the question that comes to my mind then is God has been preparing your life journey to receive him. And one day you did as Lord and Savior. But every day he wants to give you something. That, that he wants to give you gifts every day. And what might those be? And the question is, are you ready to receive him? Are you ready to receive those gifts? What must you do to be ready? Just like we talked about the land, Abraham had to go into the land because his descendants would come and the Messiah would come there. So he need to get his people there. All right. The next section is, is called Get Back. So what happened is through famines and this sort of thing, uh, the people of God were moved off the land and they headed down to Egypt because uh, uh, they, were, they needed food. And so they were distracted from the land. And so uh, where Abraham walked to and fro, they headed down to Egypt and, uh, and because of the famine... Um, then God would, time was up. The 400 years were up that God uh, prophesied would happen as they went down. Um, He sent along Moses. Uh, He would use Moses to bring them back to the land, to bring them back to where they're supposed to be. (laughs) And so if you think about the history where we stand now and as um, when Israel was made a nation and as the Hebrew people start headed back again, isn't it amazing that they got off track and Moses came on to get them back on track. God used his power to get them back to that land again because the Messiah was supposed to come. And isn't it amazing that through the years, it's like, no, no, we need to get you back where you're supposed to be. Back where you're supposed to be. Back where you're supposed to be with the Lord, following him, walking with him. So here's something that's most amazing is that every single day, you and I have the opportunity to wander away and he does stuff to get us back to where we know that place with God. And here's the beauty is that it's through forgiveness. Did you know that he will always forgive you. If you've believed on him, he will always, there's never a time where he says, now that's enough, I'm done. Never. God's love. In Isaiah chapter 55, he says, "Uh, your ways are not my ways. So open up to Isaiah chapter 55. So that's uh, about in the middle of your Bible. If you you hit the Psalms, hang a right and uh, and then you'll come into uh, Isaiah there. But Isaiah 55, and maybe some of you memorized that at one point. Just a beautiful, if you're thirsty, um, I'm going to give you uh, water. I'm going to give you food. You don't have to buy anything. Come to me. God says, I want to take care of everything. But look at Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. This is that get back to God. This is it right here. He says, seek the Lord 
while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When are those, when are those times for you? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then listen to this. He says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. So no matter how far you stray, you're not too far away from God. And he says, turn to me because I will abundantly pardon. You know, I think oftentimes when we, we're in that place where we feel like we've gotten far away from the Lord, it's like, I just give up then. I'm too, I'm too lost and he's saying, no, 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 that's the wrong voice. That's not me talking to you. Listen to what I'm saying to you. I will have mercy on you and I will abundantly pardon you no matter where you've been. So as I was getting ready this week, Natalie also was getting ready for uh, the ladies' study, so don't go far from there because she came across something out of Jeremiah that rings true also. And uh, she read it to me and I said, you mean that's all we have to do? Because what it said in it was, here, it's this simple. Confess to God that you've sinned and he'll forgive you. It's like that simple. So Jeremiah chapter uh, three, and I wanted to read it out of, um, out of a little bit easier read uh, Bible. I have, the, I have the New King James, but uh, it rang true for me when I was, okay, Jeremiah chapter um, three, start at verse 11. Listen to this. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing because it's the key um, that God wants to offer you and me every single day. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Even faithless Israel is less guilty than treacherous Judah. Um, verse 12. So we're in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore go and give this message to Israel. This is what the Lord says. O Israel, my faithless people, come home to me again. Not beautiful. You're faithless, but he's saying, come home to me again. For I am merciful. I will not be angry with you forever. Only, here's the key, only acknowledge your guilt. You know, he already knows. <laughs> and so just saying, I just love it. Admit that you are, that you rebelled against the Lord your God and committed adultery against him by worshiping idols and under every green tree. Confess that you have refused to listen to my voice. I, the Lord, have got, the Lord has spoken. Return home, you wayward children, says the Lord, for I am your master. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. One from this town, Two from that family, from wherever you are scattered, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. You who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. And then your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord. You will no longer wish for the good old days. <laughs> I think we think of that too. Well, back in the 50s, the good old days. You won't even wish for the good old days, right? But listen to this, good old days. When you possess the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, you will not miss those days or even remember them. There will be no need to rebuild the Ark. In that day, Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord they will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days, the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north, and they will return to the land I give, I gave your ancestors as an inheritance forever. This land that we 
talk about is Israel is key. But if you've known the Lord as your Savior, the land right here is key. And so when he says, return to me, that's a beautiful thing. What other God or whatever religion says, just confess and come back to me. There's other ones that say, well, you got to do this, and you got to do this for five days, stand on your head and do, 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 you know, do all these things, and then maybe you'll be free. No, he says, my ways are beyond yours. I'm going to have mercy because I choose, that's who I am. So come home, come home. So if that's you today, could you do the next slide there? Um, if that's you today, um, Jesus came and he became one of us. So I asked this question the other day is, why did God have to become human in order for your sins to be forgiven? Why couldn't he just say, I forgive you and everything's done? Why did he have to become human? Yes, Mark. That was the only way he could save the people of Israel. <laughs> Anybody. Anybody. Because he had to be God. And Adam was God, oh, a man, and he blew it. Okay. The first Adam blew it, the second. So go to the next slide there, Tony. He, uh, he walked. He had to become human in order to bleed and die. What? He actually died. This God man, the only, you can't, God cannot die. He had to become one of us in order to pay the ultimate price for our sins to be forgiven, he had to become one of us. Right there. Is that amazing? He came and touched down on earth. Grew up as a little baby, as a, as a baby grew up. But the only way that he could save us was he had to die on the cross for our sins. So you and I have a great inheritance, a great privilege to be adopted into his family. I don't, there's only one person that's Jewish in here, and that would be Gene over here. He's our only Jewish man that's with us. The rest of us are adopted in. Well, I guess Gene is too, into the family of God through Christ. So, today... All of us are given the privilege to receive God's forgiveness, no matter where we've been, a restart. God loves us. So, in Isaiah chapter 14, it says that uh, there's a, a child will be given to us, will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to rule it and establish it from this time on and forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Oh, amen? amen? He is accomplishing it. And we're just agreeing with him. So, in John 1, 14, why don't you go there as we close out our time here soon. A Gospel of John, John chapter 1. And I recited uh, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. But let's go back to, uh, let's go back to uh, uh, verse 1. Here's the full scope. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and this life was the light of man. 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world, he was in the world and the world was made through him. That's an amazing statement right there. He was in his creation. He was in his world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus, he's awakened you to this truth. Now, the whole, the whole scripture is written that now you respond by, by his power, through his power, to live in this way, kingdom here on earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because you've believed in the Lord Jesus, the kingdom of God is it. Wherever you go, God's will is happening because he's in you. So how do you know God's speaking to your mind and your heart? It's about his, his kingdom. It's about the lives of people around you. It's about the Holy Spirit that is giving each of you the power to do what you can't do in the flesh. You can't just try harder. You receive the Holy Spirit and you ask for his power to live. So in uh, Zechariah 14.4, it says that he will touch down again. <laughs> It records that he's going to step down on the Mount of Olives and the valley's going to spread and he's going to come in and set up the new kingdom. It's amazing to think about. Here's something that's interesting. is There's prophecy that he's going to come in through the Golden Gate. Golden Gate, there's a couple of gates, big, big gates there. And it's just on this side of the temple. It's the closest you can get to the temple. And there's some people that they don't believe, but they decided to seal that gate just in case. Think that's going to stop the Lord from coming. But why did they even do that, right? So today, you and I, um, we celebrate the touchdown of the astronauts in 1969. Many of us watched that on the screen. But the real touchdown is when Christ entered your heart, stepped into your life, changed you forever. It talks about the astronauts that after that they went and they, uh, they were paraded all through the major cities in, in uh, the United States and then they went overseas. It was like they were like in 70 some different places and, and just this thing that has been done. They had a platform to share how great, you know, what great a thing happened. But each one of us have a platform to share. Maybe it's just in our family. Maybe it's at work. But the lives that we live and the words that we speak are words for life. Okay, so I'm going to pray and Nicole's going to play some songs here and and, uh, and then we're going to transform this room into a, a dining room. And uh, we're going to eat for a little bit. And then Natalie and I are going to show you some uh, slides from Israel. 
And uh, at the end, um, we have some people here that they're going to be able to answer some questions because Natalie and I were going through stuff going, I don't remember where that picture's from. And so I'm going to ask them to help us on clarifying some things. So at the end, you're gonna, if you have questions, you can ask, and then I'll call on David and uh, Gracie and to uh, help answer if we don't have the answer. Um, but let's thank the Lord. Go ahead, Nicole, and we'll... Lord, uh, I want to speak for us that we here in this room just want to thank you because we don't deserve any good thing, but you keep pouring good things on us, and we just want to say thank you. Lord, also we understand there's pain that happens in this life, and uh, it's an opportunity for us to trust you even through that. So, Lord, just thank you for that training because none of us really listen unless we have some pain involved. And so, Lord, I pray that we've learned well. And Lord, if today might be the day of healing for somebody in this room uh, physically, maybe this is the day that you want to heal them and, and do that. And I just want to pray healing for physical healing in this room. Lord God, um, nothing's impossible with you. And so, Lord, if that's now, we just receive that. Father, if there's others in this room here that really, they haven't believed in you with their life enough to repent and, uh, and follow you and, and be filled with your spirit, and be baptized in your spirit, um, Lord, maybe today that you're touching them and you're saying, come on home, come on home. This is where you belong. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, you would do that. And I just agree with you, as well as my brothers and sisters, I agree with you about your saving plan of forgiveness. So thank you, Lord. And then, Lord, um, there's others in this room here that may be suffering from anxiety. Um, there's stuff, there's worry. And uh, I pray that you would just take that and turn that around to uh, to a place of uh, praising you, even though. I pray that you would take that anxiety and that fear away because you are not the God of fear. You've, you're the God of love. You've given us um, the spirit of power, love, and, and a sound mind. And so I pray that. Just thank you, Lord God. Lord, finally, I just, I'm just talking to you, Lord, and my family is listening on, and I just want to thank you for the trip and thank you for the finances that this body has, has allowed me and Natalie to go and to enjoy and be awakened again about that promised land there, but that promised land within each of us. And so, Lord, as we share a meal together, I thank you for the food. I just want to bless that right now. Um, just bless the food. Thank you, Lord, that we need food for these bodies to keep on living and we need water but what we already took in is spiritual food because we need spiritual food to live in this new life too. And so we thank you for you are the bread of life. You said, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. We thank you that you satisfy us. So bless our time together as we share around the table and as we share what happened in Jerusalem and in, in Israel. And uh, may you just keep uh, keep giving us a wonderful time here today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.